Linda and I'm a tax junkie. I felt like I should confess that in front of all of you. Uh, as we first, as, uh, as you all showed up this evening, I tried to speak to some of you and find out what everybody's favorite tax subject was so I could try to at least cover it. But nobody came up with a favorite tax subject other than not paying any <laughs> <laughs> or deductions. Um, Nancy's given me four things she'd like me to cover briefly, but it's very hard to cover anything in 10 minutes. So what I thought I'd do is put some ideas in your head, and I'm hoping that you're going to ask lots of questions for both Mike and for me. Um, taxes are fun. Don't you think taxes are fun and easy? Yeah, no. <laughs> I've spent over 30 years of my life doing taxes, and I love them. That's why I told you I'm a tax junkie. Now, what is it that accountants spend their whole life trying to do? It, part of Yeah. We spend our whole professional lives, at least, trying to turn ordinary income into... Who said that? Capital gain. Bravo. Bravissimo. Exactly. Now, why is it a good idea to turn ordinary income into a capital gain? It's taxed at a lower rate. Yes, and the normal rate for something you hold for at least one year and one day is 15%. Oh, I love this audience participation. Yes, closer, sorry. Is that better? Yeah, I do have a self voice. I apologize. Okay, the, the normal capital gain rate is 15%. Unless you have a really, really big capital gain. Um, I had a lady whose income was $50,000, and she had a $200,000 capital gain on a rental property she'd owned for a long time, and she didn't do a tax-free exchange or a tax-deferred exchange. Anyway, she had to pay alternative minimum tax. So the capital gain rate could be higher, okay? But normally it's about 15 Now. What else is good about capital gains? Pardon? What, what, is else, what else is good about capital gains? Pardon? Deferred. That's right. If you do what? If you do what? If you trade one property for another. Yes, it's called a Starker transaction, Section 1031, tax-free exchange, like-kind, tax-deferred. There's one other name I can't think of. But anyway, if you do one of those, you don't have to pay any tax until you sell the when? The last property for the last time. That's right. Okay. Now tell me about depreciation. Where does that come in with rental properties? That's right. If you make a capital improvement, you can take depreciation on it. That's true. That's one of the questions we're going to cover. Also, on the property when you buy it. Let's say you buy a little property. Um, where could you get? Well, let's say it's a $400,000 property, and it's $200,000 is the land, and the property itself is worth the improvement, is worth two hundred. Can you depreciate the whole four hundred? No, because supposedly land doesn't depreciate. Now you might argue with that in the past couple of <laughs> in the past couple of years, but normally land doesn't depreciate. So you get to take depreciation on the building and the improvements. But then what happens when you sell the property? You do have to pay back the tax that you've already deducted. But it's not so bad because maybe you were in a 35 or even 40 percent bracket by the time you add in your state return. Don't forget your state taxes. What's the maximum rate you have to pay on recaptured depreciation? 25. So even if you're in the 35 percent bracket, you only have to pay it back at 25. Now, why do you think Congress has invented all these wonderful laws to um, encourage people to buy real estate? To keep me in business? <laughs> <laughs> and all of us in business, that's true. Yes, it's, it's, because, it's because they don't want you to have to live on Social Security. That's my feeling. But many, many laws that have to do with real estate are very, very favorable to the investor because Congress wants you to put money aside, whether it's in your own home when you get the $500,000 or $250,000 exclusion, or if you just have two homes, how, many, how, many, how much mortgage can you deduct on two homes? The home you live in and a second home. Up to a million dollars. You can deduct the interest on up to a million. So many of these laws that were invented, 
And like I say, I've been doing taxes over 30 years, and my only specialty in tax law is real estate. Now, I do have other people in my office that are all brilliant, but and they some of them specialize in it too. But the real estate tax laws, in my opinion, are absolutely fascinating. Don't you think so? No? Okay, now let me check what else I was supposed to talk about today. Ah, potential profit in real estate. Isn't there potential profit? Sure. It depends on whether you have a good realtor to help you find the property and a good settlement attorney, as some of you are here, and good people to help you um, improve the property. Okay, otherwise than that, I can not I can go on forever, but I think I better pass it over to Mike. But think about all your questions. Maybe I've you know, stirred some up and I'm here to help you. Thanks. All right, how's everybody this evening? Yeah, this is a great looking crowd. I am, I was born into the real estate business, literally. I'm a second generation realtor. Uh, my dad started in 59, so our company's been around for 52 years. I tell people I was sitting on open houses when I was 10 years old. So the only reason I tell you that is just to give you a little bit of background of where I'm coming from. We're an old fashioned family type business that does a little bit of everything. We don't specialize in one thing, we do a little bit of everything. We've done land development, I'm still a registered home builder. Uh, we do property management, commercial and residential. We do sales, I represent buyers and sellers just like an average real estate agent. So tonight we're talking about buy and hold versus fix and flip. So I'm gonna give you a few nuggets from my perspective that I think overlap on both, both of them and then I'll segregate them just a little bit. Uh, to give you a little background, the majority of the work that I do is in Prince George's County. Some are in the, I do a little bit of work in Calvert and Arundel as well, but the majority of it's in Prince George's County. So one thing that you're looking at when you're looking at properties for either buy and hold or fix and flip, obviously you've got to look at location because, and, and either way you're going to do it, you have to look at the property as if I'm going to do a fix and flip, you have to think, if I can't flip it, can I buy, hold it, and rent it? So you have to keep that in mind when you do both. At least that's, that's the way that I do business. I tell what the investors that I work with, if you're looking at a property, we have to look at the worst case scenario. If we can't flip it, can you rent it and still make money, still have positive cash flow out of the property? So some of the things that we look at or I tell my investors to look at is look for properties that you can add value to. Well. That's like shooting fish in a barrel these days because everything is in such bad shape. If you just fix it up a little bit, you've added a ton of value to it. But what I'm talking about are things like what are the minimum things that a buyer or a renter is looking for in a property? Most people are looking for at least three bedrooms. Most people are looking for more than one full bath. Most people prefer to have a master bath if possible. Most people prefer to have extra storage space, like a basement. So when you're out looking at properties for either fix and flip or for buy and hold, if you're looking at single family properties, look for properties that you, they may not have to start out as a three bedroom, but look for a property that you can modify so that it becomes a three bedroom or more. Look for properties that you can modify to add a master bath or a master, a half bath or an additional bath in the basement. Then you've done two of the things that I've already said, which is you're adding value to the property and you're adding saleability and rentability to the property. The statistics at NAR say, I believe over 80% of buyers start their search or renters as well on a computer. And the biggest things that they look at are location, price, number of bedrooms, and then number of bathrooms. Those are the four main criteria that most people punch in their search. Some people go on to put a ton of other stuff, but those are the four main things they look at. So if you're thinking about doing a buy, fix, or flip, just a couple of things to keep in mind when you're looking at the houses so that you think, okay, if I do this, am I making a product that's gonna be sellable? If you're buying, uh, another thing that we do, we tell clients to and some people may not like this, but we avoid condos. 
Condos may be a good investment to some people, but they may not be a good investment to some people. In today's market, and all you realtors that are in here can back this up, how many condos do you try to sell in the first? Now you've got to ask not only what's the percentage of owners versus renters, you have to ask what's the percentage of your delinquency rate for your fees. Um, and those things can make the future sale or even your future refinancing of the property impossible if the percentage of owners versus renters is too high, if the, the delinquency rate's too high. And unfortunately, the, the, the uh, federal backed lenders are tightening those restrictions, which makes it even harder for somebody in a condo now to sell to somebody else who wants to live in it because of these restrictions. They're causing many condo associations to go further in the hole in delinquency and go higher in the tenant versus owner ratio. So, it, uh, so we avoid condos. If you want to invest in condos, just be very careful when you do it going in so that you're very aware of what you're doing. Uh, HOAs, not quite so bad, but you got to be careful with the HOAs too. Um, again, a lot of it's going to be based on location, but you really need to look into the HOAs financial condition um, and the rules and regulations and what the HOA is responsible for because all of that has an effect on either way, whether you want to buy and hold something to rent, because if you have an HOA or a condo association that's got outrageous fees, you may not be able to rent it for enough to cover your costs, or the costs may go up substantially while you're there. Um, and if you're going to, obviously, if you're going to fix and flip, you've got the same issue with HOAs that you do with condos as far as uh, the financial condition of the HOA, and if they have judgments, liens, if they're being filed, if suits filed against them, if they can't do what they're supposed to do. Makes it difficult for a buyer to win. So avoiding HOAs and condos makes your life easy. <laughs> um, let's see. Some of the things that I was asked to talk about were preparing for rental losses. If you're going to buy and hold and you're going to rent, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I would highly recommend you hire a manager like Chris, somebody who's very experienced in the business, to manage that property for you. I have a lot of people that come and say, oh, you know, I just want to buy one, one rental property and I'll manage myself, save a little bit of money. The first mistake they do is become friends with their tenants. You have to keep it on a business level. If you're going to buy and hold, you have to keep the relationship on a business level. If you become friends with your tenants, that doesn't mean you can't be friendly with them. Just if you become friends with your tenants, that's the tenant who's going to take advantage of you first. They're going to call you and say, "Ah, oh, you know, I'm on vacation. I'm running a little short this month. Oh, don't worry about it. You know, we'll catch up." Before you know it, that's the tenant that's three months behind. <laughs> Yeah, but are they still your friend? <laughs> so in this business, uh, Chris was, it was a very apropos, the tenant, the, the uh, topic that Chris was talking about earlier, tenant screening. Very, very key to what you're going to do. And there are people out there that still have good credit. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't find good tenants anymore. There are fantastic people out there that have fantastic credit who will pay on time and have a history of paying on time. They're there. Um, but you do need to prepare for rental losses. I'm going to tell you a little horror story right now that uh, just is coming to a head actually this week. A lady that I now know decided to buy another house, move, and she kept her existing house, going to turn it into a rental. I was not involved in the sale or the rental of the property. She rented it, used real estate agents, they ran a credit check, um, the potential tenant had a 620 credit score. Moved him in in October. First thing that happened was they accepted a personal check for part of the security deposit. First thing that happened was that check bounced. That tenant never paid again from October of 2010. They just got evicted this Monday. Let me tell you, they, I've heard it said before that a, a shrewd tenant can stay in a property without paying for up to a year. 
This guy did nine months. He came damn close. First thing we did when the, the owner came to me after she was recommended to me and said, help me, I need to get this guy out. Will you manage this property for me? I said, I will help you get him out. And once we get it out, then we'll talk about the management part of it. Filed suit, went to court. He shows up. I mean, I'm, I'd sent him a ton of letters. He never responded to anything. Filed suit, he shows up. He says to the judge, he and air condition doesn't work. Judge says, okay, rent escrow. I said, great, no problem. Rent escrow means the tenant's got to pay their rent into the court within four days usually, and they have 10 days to have a report from a county inspector about the issue in the house. He never paid into court, never called the county. Case was reset to rehear. We went back to court. He did not show up. I said to the ju judge, says, no money was paid in the escrow. We have no report. We got a judgment. We waited the appropriate time to go back to get a writ for eviction. He was at the courthouse when I filed the writ. He handed me the bankruptcy filing that he had just done. That stopped everything that I could do. That caused the owner of the property to now hire an attorney who at this point she's into the attorney for about $3,500. The attorney had to go to bankruptcy court start the proceedings to get the stay from the bankruptcy removed. The bankruptcy was dismissed on the technicality because the guy never finished filling out his bankruptcy paperwork. The attorney refiled for landlord tenant court for a judgment, got another writ, the guy refiled bankruptcy again. Long story short, the writ that we just evicted on Monday was a writ that was issued in March, and it took until July for the Sheriff's Department in Prince George's County to act on the writ. So this all ties into the preparing for rental losses portion <laughs> that I'm talking about. I would say that it would probably be prudent for you to have a cushion of six months to carry a property and without, okay, Chris is saying higher. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. On the way out, this guy took the furnace, took the air conditioning, took the wash. He took the furnace. Not, the, yeah, oh yeah, the one that did. Not just took the coil out for scrap. He took the furnace. He took the air conditioning. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the rental losses, I think you need, Chris is probably right, six months may be a little shy, but I didn't screen this guy. If I screened him, he wouldn't have been in there that long. He would have never got it in the first place. Anyway. <laughs> that would probably be a better question for somebody who actually deals with Section 8. I don't. I work in Prince George's County. I have the ability to not accept Section 8. Um, oh, he asked about Section 8, um, about the damage part. And I don't have enough experience with Section 8 to, to answer that question. But Chris does. Right. What's your, how much money are you going to spend to collect nothing? say about investing in real estate I, I always tell that the my stockbroker what he tells me about buying this stock I say you show me a stock that I can buy it I can get positive cash flow I can take a depreciation deduction and when I make maintenance repairs I can write them off against the income and if the son of a gun burns down the insurance company is going to build me a new one you find me a stock that does that <laughs> So, uh, let's see, let's see, I've already talked about rental law. Let's just jump back to the, to the uh, buy and, or fix and flips a little bit. You have to prepare the houses for the market you're in. 
if you're going into a fix and flip and you think you're going to put a paint job and it's still got old windows and you're just going to sweep it out and brim it up and put it on the market, you're going to be sadly mistaken. The buyers in today's market, and I'm not talking about high dollar houses, the, we're talking the under $200,000 price range, those buyers want granite, they want stainless steel, they want ceramic bathrooms, they want updated lighting. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that too. Uh, so it is, if you're gonna be in the fix and flip market now, you really have to look at the property you're buying with the eye of what do I need to do. The, the, the standard that I use with my properties is it has to be in a condition that I would move my family into it before I'm going to be able to do before I will be able to sell it or rent it. I look at, do that for both sales and rental properties. Um, I've got a perfect example of this. An investor who didn't listen to me recently went in and got the white appliances, got the Formica countertop, put the linoleum down, didn't listen, house is on the market, on the market. He had another identical house, and I finally convinced him to do the stainless granite. Yeah, it's gone, it's settled, it's done. So you, you have to do certain things to make the property work. Uh, it's You can't go in and do a minimum. Okay, looks like we're running out of time. It depends. How many of these are you going to do in one year? Is this just a one-shot deal? Um, yeah, let's say one or two. Okay, you buy. Now, are you going to sell it within one year and one day? You got ordinary income. Whatever that gain is, yes, if it's under a year and a day, then whatever that income is, it's going to get added on top of all your other income. And taxed at the full rate, federal and state. Yeah, up so, to 35 federal. But if you do more than, is there a certain, if you do over X number, then it, that does not apply? Well, if you hold it for a year and a day, now we're going to the long-term capital gain. It, yes, yes. But it doesn't matter how many you do. You did yes, you. it matters a whole bunch. If you do a, several of them in a year, now you become a, what's called a dealer, and it's always ordinary income. And it can be also considered earned income. So now it's subject to federal tax, state tax, Social Security, and Medicare tax. Oh, yeah. So is, there a, is there a hard number, like if you do more than five? If you do more than one, we have to look at your intent. Now, let's say that you bought something and you really had the intent to keep it. You know, you're going to fix it up and rent it. And then you realize, oh, my goodness, maybe there's some druggies going on in the area and you just decide to sell it. Okay, well, that, your intent wasn't to do that originally. So if you just sell it, I'd be willing to sign that tax return or anybody in my office would. That really, your intent was to hold, not hold it, but to sell it. Excuse me, was to hold it, but now you've sold it. Good question. That kind of leads me into one of the questions that I was going to ask you, Linda, and that is to talk about the advantages of long-term visit versus short-term. Yes. Oh well. Here's the deal. If if you if you're a rent, if you're a realtor, and you're going to be buying and selling properties, they just look at your normal. You know, where do you make your money? And they're going to say, if if Mike does it, then he's going to be considered ipso facto immediately a dealer. So he's got a problem. He just has to include that as his ordinary income. But if you're if you're you have a regular job, you know, you have a day job and you're an engineer, I love engineers. Oh my fifth ex husband was an engineer. He was wonderful. <laughs> They're so organized. <laughs> so Oh you oh you drive a train. Oh I thought Okay, I, I was thinking civil or aeronautical. Okay. <laughs> so if you're an engineer during the day and that's your main source of income and you buy a piece of property and you could buy one and fix it up and sell it 
And now if you take less than a year and a day, what happens? It becomes ordinary income. But let's say you take your time, maybe you work on it on weekends, you and your wife, you go over there and you fill it. It takes a year and exactly one day. Okay, now you've got a capital gain and I'd sign that tax return happily. Okay, especially because you're an engineer and I know you'll keep good records. <laughs> Okay, you've got five or six. Okay, there is the law that says that if you live, sorry. Oh, sorry, yes, of course. Okay, this lady says, what happens if you have five or six properties and you decide you want to move into one and then wait the two years and sell it? Yes, that law is still in effect. Now, here's the deal. Every year that it was rented after January 1st of 2009, you're going to lose a little bit of your exclusion. So let's say that you're, you're a married couple, you'd have a $500,000 exclusion, but maybe you've owned it 10 years, and two of those 10 years, it was a rental property after um, January of 2009. Well, then that means you'll be allowed to claim only 80% of 500000 okay? <laughs> well, no, but she would have one because she's had to recoup her depreciation. Yeah, yeah, she would. This is very good. I've had clients who had, I can tell you a really cute story. I had clients, the lady was from South Carolina, and she and her husband, who um, owned five houses, and this was just before the law changed, and they owned one in Prince George's County, Howard County. They had five different places. So I had them move into each place for, and live in it for two years. But then they got down to the last two properties, which were um, condos located in College Park. And she said, I don't care what you do, I'm not gonna move into those condos. So I said, well, during the time when you're doing all these other ones, what we'll do is we'll sell the two condos, we needed you at the time, and, and we'll put all of that money, and where do you wanna retire? And she said, whoa, let's retire to South Carolina. Okay, so they sold the properties in uh, Prince George's County, the condos, put the money in South Carolina. Now, during the next couple of years, while this was going on, they had lots of time on the property in South Carolina to put new kitchens, new landscaping. They did everything they wanted to it so that when they finally did move into it, it was their dream retirement property. This is how I help people. It's so much fun. I love buy and hold. I, you know, historically, I've, you know, at least up until a couple of years ago, you could usually always make a profit. If you had a good realtor and a good, if you've had lots of good help along the way. Um, but, of course, in the couple of years ago, people were also fighting. Either way, but you have to get, you know, it depends on the person's personality. Many times I'll have clients come in, I can see they're nervous about keeping the property more or spending more money on fixing it up rather than keeping it or whatever. So we, we kind of adjust it. But I can do it both ways. I'll, I can do a spreadsheet saying, this is what will happen, you know, supposedly maybe over the next 10 years, and this is what will happen if you sell it next week. Okay. It's fun. It's fun. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I own and hold a, a quite a few properties, and uh, it's overall been a fantastic investment. Uh, yeah, I gave you the one horror story that was just to illustrate the point of preparing for the worst. Uh, but what I find is if you do your homework up front, you screen the tenants very well, follow the standard, like Chris said, of a set screening standard, and you let the tenants know that you're watching what they're doing. So if they get a day late, a notice goes out, so a phone call, something like that. I find that people that have, generally, I find that people that have good credit also tend to take care of the property and also tend to pay you on time because they want to continue in that good credit vein. So that's a, the whole point of doing the background search. I would say that, that that horror story that I told you in my 24 years, that is the absolute worst case that I've had in 24 years.
absolutely. I I met the insurance adjuster and a police officer at the property today. <laughs> so there you go. But no, I, I would certainly. That's right. And you paid for that risk transfer. So take advantage of it. But ab absolutely do not want to scare people away from uh, buy and hold. We've held apartment buildings. And you said you guys do multifamily. I love small multifamily buildings. They are fantastic. Because, okay, let's say you've got a four-unit multifamily. A tenant unit moves out, you still got three incomes coming in. Two tenants move out, you still got two incomes coming in. You got a single family detached and a tenant moves out, you got nothing. So, you know, the multifamilies are great, and the small multifamilies, if you can still find them, they're fewer and fewer to find nowadays, that are four or more, they still work on an FHA sale as an owner-occupied if the buyer wants to buy and live in one and rent the other three out. So, yeah, so you could, if you wanted to do that, if you found an area you wanted to live in a building, you could buy it, live in one of the unit, use an FHA 3.5% down payment, rent your other three units out, and have three people paying your mortgage for you. Fantastic. And, you know, let's see, there's nobody in here who's going to turn me in for this. When you rent the other three units and uh, you paint them, that's a maintenance and repair expense that you can write off against the rent. So you just have to make sure that expense was enough to cover the painter to come paint your unit, too. <laughs> she didn't hear that. So. absolutely does not. Any of you here who are self-employed, you really, really know to need to know about what's called a solo 401k because you are allowed to borrow up to $50,000 or half of what's in your account, whichever is less. And you can take that money out of your solo 401k and use it to buy property. And if you're married, you can each be self-employed. You could each take out up to $50,000. And it doesn't matter the reason. You can take the money out to buy a boat. You can take it out for any reason you want. If you're taking it out to buy your own home, you're loaning it to yourself, then you have a 15-year payback. If you're taking the money out of your solo 401k, you can take it out for five years, and you can use that money for any purpose to buy, to flip, to re fix up, to hold, anything you want. Okay. If you have any questions on solo 401k, I love them. And it's in my handout there about them, too. They're fantastic. have used rent to owns on and off over the past over the years in fact I have a client it's in a rent to own in Laurel right now that we did last year um, rent to own in, and this is just my opinion rent to own is fantastic for the property owner as long as you don't ever intend that property to go to settlement because if they can't afford to buy this year they probably won't be able to afford to buy next year if they're credit now some people may but we haven't had very much success with rent to owners actually going to buy. But what it does do for the landlord or the property owner is you usually can charge a premium rent for that rent to own. And there's usually no refund of that premium if they don't buy. So in a market right now, it's a good tool to use to attract more potential tenants to your property because everybody calls for a rental 
and I would say 50% 50, 50 of the people that call on our rentals want to know if it's a rent to own. Doesn't mean they'd ever qualify to buy it. They want to, they, they want to think in their mind that they may have the ability to buy this property sometime in the future. You said... And if they, and if they end up do qualifying? If they end up do qualifying, you, you have to go into it prepared that if they do qualify and buy, great, you're happy with that. But you also have to go and prepare that they may never qualify. Well, it's real. It's really difficult to do the, the, the price. And the key to the price thing is you have to decide as an investor. You have to first off, you set a time limit. Most of them are one year. Most of the ones that I deal with one year. So you as an investor have to decide, no matter what the market conditions do, what is the price that I'd be willing to accept 12 months from now. And it's kind of like going to an auction. You have to have in your head what you're going to spend before the bid opens, and you can't go past it. So, so it's you. You really got to set in a market like this. The prices aren't going. The fluctuation is probably going to go down. So it's hard to set the strike price. So you kind of have to set it at what today's market is. But you have to be prepared. If it doesn't appraise at the other end, you might have to lower it. And if the market value goes up, you may not be able to get that, but you might be able to get it in the increased rent that you've accepted. Uh, well, it depends on how your agreement it depends on how your agreement is structured. If it doesn't go through, yeah, you might have to give the uh, you might have to give the option feedback. Obviously, yeah, definitely we look at the rental comps, of course, to see what it'll rent for, but we also look at, um, what would the, let me see how to phrase this best. We also look at what the sale market is in the area to, to compare those values with the rentals so we can see if your rent is substantially below what the mortgage payments would be on a sale market. So we're trying to get a, uh, at least that's what, one of the things we look at. I'm trying to trying to think of something else. But. This is also part of a bigger strategy. If you're trying to grow a portfolio and you buy a property today, you're trying to get the market value. You can either flip it and take that money out and buy two more, mm -hmm. or if you can borrow 70% against it. And buy another one, sure. Or if you flip the property, you don't. Right. Well, and, and the upfront, I think I'd said it earlier, is when I'm, when I'm working with people that are looking to buy and hold or to fix and flip in either direction, if they're, if they're doing a buy and hold, the numbers still have to work for the buy and the renovation and the hold. You can't go into a market where the houses are $150,000, pay $100, put $75, and expect to be coming out smelling like roses on the other end. And when you're doing the, uh, the fix and flip, the other side of that is you still have to buy and do a renovation and make sure your numbers work so that if the flip doesn't work, you can turn around and rent it out and still be covered and not lose anything. So it's definitely the, the sale market analysis is huge in either one, either the buyer hold or the fix and flip. You've got to see what the market is doing and don't put yourself out on a limb above the market. I love real estate. I think it's wonderful. I, I got a real estate broker's license when I was 21 years old because I was keeping the books for a real estate company while I was in college. 
except when I graduated, I decided I didn't want to do real estate anymore, and I went into taxes, because taxes are easy. But what I, one thing I want to talk to you about as far as taxes are, don't let the tax tail wag the investment dog. Don't buy something because you think it's going to, um, or don't not buy something just because you think you're going to have to pay a lot of tax on it. You never go broke paying tax on a profit if it's a real profit. And you never want to buy something just because it's a write-off. Okay? You should always have a good tax person. It doesn't have to be me, but somebody who knows real estate tax law. It's a whole different specialty, a big specialty. And a lot of people make all their decisions just from the tax point of view. You don't want to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, 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 but every congressman, every senator, every representative, they have at least one home in Washington and one home in their home state. So first of all, they've got to cut their own throats. Will they get reelected if they sign that? No. I don't, see, I don't see it happening. I mean, they may limit it because in some countries, a lot of foreign countries, you can't even deduct the interest on your home. I mean, it's already limited to $1 million anyway, no matter how many homes you own. I'm talking homes. I'm not talking about investment properties. So if you have a really nice house in, in Great Falls or in Potomac and you have a cabin in the woods, the most you can deduct the interest on at any one time, this is not during your lifetime, it's once at a time, is up to a million dollars. Plus a $100,000 HELOC. What's a HELOC? Home equity line of credit. So you can have up to a one million one. But I don't see it happening, you know? I do a couple of congressmen and senators' taxes. God knows why they come to me, because I yell at them from the minute they walk in my door. <laughs> they're, they're definitely into uh, abuse. I, I think I, I feel like I'm the dominatrix, and I say, I'm not going to do your taxes. You didn't vote for this, or you didn't do that. And they say, oh, well, my, my constituents needed this, or I had to do this to get reelected. But I can't see that one happening. Do you? Does anybody here think that they'll limit it more? Oh, good. OK, I'm glad you agree with me. I didn't want to go out on the limb. I don't, I don't like any of them. Paolo, who speaks Italian here, is going to know what I'm saying. The Italians have a saying about politicians. Anche il più pulito alla rogna. And in Italian it means, vero, vero. Okay, in Italian they say, of all the politicians, even the cleanest one has scabies. You know? You know? So you can imagine what the dirty ones have. I don't like any of them. I very rarely vote for them unless I'm really excited about something. I'm sorry. I hate them. I hate them. I see what happens. Listen, don't blame Internal Revenue Service for these tax laws. Who makes the tax laws? Congress. Congress. So be careful when you vote because you're going to get what you vote for. Okay? 